This is a University of Otago podcast. This is a University of Otago podcast. This lecture is in honour of Professor Frank Guest, who was the first full time professor and dean of the law faculty. And it's quite nice that Bruce Robinson should be here tonight because he's one of the students who set up this very lecture after Frank Guest uh, died rather suddenly. It's a joint venture between the Otago Law Faculty and the profession. And at the end of tonight's lecture, the president of the Otago uh, Law Society, my colleague, Associate Professor Donna Buckingham, will propose the vote of thanks. We have a wonderful speaker tonight. He's come all the way from London, especially to give this speech, in a very long way. And he's been sponsored by the Law Foundation. His name is Lord Phillips of Worth Matravers, which is in Dorset. He's here because the New Zealand Law Foundation generously give a large amount of money for a distinguished visitor to come and visit all the law faculties in New Zealand each year. And this year's visitor is Lord Phillips. I'll give you a wee bit about Lord Phillips. Um, Lord Phillips was educated at King's College, Cambridge, after completing national service with the Royal Navy. He was called to the bar at the Middle Temple in 1962. He was made a Queen's Council in 1978, became a recorder in 1982, and was appointed a High Court Judge, Queen's Bench Division, in 1987, reset in the commercial court. He became a Lord Justice of Appeal in 1995 and a Lord of Appeal in Ordinary in 1999. Lord Phillips became Master of the Rolls in 2000 and Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales in 2005. He was the first Lord Chief Justice to be head of the judiciary when this role was transferred from the Lord Chancellor in 2006. Lord Phillips then became the Senior Lord of Appeal in Ordinary, the Senior Law Lord in 2008 and he was the first president of the Supreme Court when it was established in 2009. He was president of the UK Supreme Court from 2009 to 2012, and he's a Knight Commander, Knight Companion of the Order of the Garter. Currently, Lord Phillips is, a, is the Dixon Poon Distinguished Fellow and Visiting Professor at King's College London. He's the president of the Qatar International Court and a judge on the Court of Final Appeal of Hong Kong. He has seven honorary Doctor of Laws degrees, but most of all, <laughs> But most of all, he enjoys walking and swimming. He's just like you and I, the normal <laughs> bloke. He's walked over um, Flagstaff since he's been here, and he's walked mostly around the peninsula, swum twice around the harbour. And <laughs> he's a very normal person. So, <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to invite Lord Phillips to give the 45th FW Guest Lecture on the topic, The Impact of Human Rights on Domestic Courts. Please give Lord Phillips a big, warm, okay, <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a great honor to have been invited to give this prestigious lecture and a great pleasure to be invited to, to Dunedin despite this momentary lapse in your well-known fine weather. <laughs> uh, I gather it's likely to be restored tomorrow so I'll be able to give a little support to the English team. <laughs> I, I'm one of a dwindling number who can remember the end of the Second World War. My mother's parents were Jewish which meant that so far as the Germans were concerned, uh, she was Jewish and so was I uh, and my sister. When invasion of England seemed a real possibility, my father sent my mother and my sister and myself across the Atlantic to stay with his aunt and uncle on a farm in Alberta in Canada. We returned when the danger was over. As a reaction to the horrors that had been the cause of our evacuation, the United Nations Charter was signed on the 26th of June, 1945. Three years later, the inspirational leadership of Eleanor Roosevelt led to the adoption by 48 members of the General Assembly of the, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Universal Declaration was in its turn the model for the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. The United Kingdom played a leading role in the drafting of the convention and one is, was one of the first signatories of it in 1950. From that moment, however, the attitude of my country to the convention has been ambivalent and that is as true today as it ever was. There is currently a strong reaction on the part of many against our membership of the European Union and that goes hand in hand with a hostility to the European Convention on Human Rights, 
and more particularly to the European Court of Human Rights at Strasbourg. Let me quote from a typical article in the Daily Mail on 8th of February last year under the heading, We Must Stand Up to the Euro Judges. The decision by an immigration judge to grant bail to Abu Qatada, one of the world's most dangerous fanatics, is a truly perverse and disturbing state of affairs. But although Mr Justice Mitting caused outrage by giving Osama bin Laden's ambassador in Europe bail terms which allow him to walk his youngest child to school, he is not the person to blame for this shambles. He's merely a puppet whose strings have been tugged remotely by the unelected and unaccountable judges at the European Court of Human Rights. Later, the article complained that Strasbourg has extended the scope of the convention beyond all reasonable limits. Articles such as this led to Nicholas Bratzer, after his election to the presidency of the European Court, to complain in a public seminar in Edinburgh in March 1911, the vitriolic, and I'm afraid to say xenophobic, fury directed against the judges of my court is unprecedented in my experience as someone who has been involved with the convention system for over 40 years. The scale and the tone of the current hostility directed towards the court and the convention system as a whole by the press, by members of West the Westminster Parliament and by senior members of the government has created understandable dismay and resentment among the judges in Strasbourg. My sympathies are with Nicholas Bratzer. As he went on to point out, the Strasbourg court pays very careful attention to the decisions of the English courts on human rights issues and only a very small proportion of applications to Strasbourg against the United Kingdom are successful. At the same time, I do believe that the Strasbourg Court has enlarged the reach of the Human Rights Convention in a way that's gone beyond what the parties anticipated when they subscribed to it. There is at present in England a lively debate as to the extent to which the Supreme Court should follow decisions of the Strasbourg Court. In this lecture, I propose to look at the unique way in which our Parliament has given domestic effect to the Convention under the Human Rights Act 1998 and at the way in which the Supreme Court has interpreted the relevant provisions of that Act. I shall draw attention to those areas where I believe that the Strasbourg Court has extended the reach of the Act beyond the agreement of the signatories to the Convention. I shall look at some areas where the Strasbourg Court has differed from the considered views of the House of Lords and the Supreme Court. Finally, I shall look at the disenchantment at Westminster with some decisions of the Strasbourg Court and the move to do our own thing by enacting a British Bill of Rights. Under the first article of the Convention, the parties agreed to secure to everyone within their jurisdiction the rights and freedoms defined by in the Convention. So what the parties agreed to at an international level was the manner in which they would treat people within their jurisdiction. I shall in due course focus on the question of what was meant by within their jurisdiction. The rights and freedoms that the parties agreed to secure for those within their jurisdictions were stated in very general terms. They included the right to life, Article 2, freedom from torture and degrading treatment or punishment, Article 3, the right to liberty, Article 5, the right to a fair trial, Article 6, the right to respect for private and family life, Article 8, and freedom of expression, Article 10. Some of these rights, such as the right to life and freedom from torture, are stated in absolute terms. Others are qualified. Thus, Article 8, which provides that everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence, goes on to provide there shall be no interference by a public authority with the exercise of this right, except such as in a, is in accordance with the law and is necessary in a de democratic society in the interests of national security, public safety, or the economic well-being of the country, for the prevention of disorder or crime, for the protection of health or morals, or for the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. Because the rights are expressed in general terms, it is necessary to define with more precision 
what it is that particular rights encompass. In defining rights, it has become generally accepted that the Convention is what has been described as a living instrument. This means that the definition of the scope of individual rights changes over time. It's not restricted to what those rights would have been thought to encompass when the Convention was agreed in the 1950s. When giving evidence to a joint parliamentary committee on the 13th of March 2012, Sir Nicholas Bratzer illustrated this by reference to the words private life, home, correspondence and family life in Article 8. He said, I think it is very difficult to confine the interpretation of those words to the meanings that they had in the 1950s. Doubtless the founders did not have in mind issues such as transsexuality, retention of DNA samples, severe noise pollution, same-sex marriages, in vitro fertilization, electronic means of communication and the like. All of these are matters that the Strasbourg Court has held to fall within the compass of Article 8. <coughs> Submission to the jurisdiction of the Strasbourg Court was optional for those who subscribed to the Convention. That jurisdiction confers on individual citizens the right to petition the Court to seek an order for compensation for the infringement of their Convention rights by their own countries. The United Kingdom was not prepared to countenance this until 1996 when a Labour government signed up to it. After this, sorry, 1966 that was, after this individuals could apply to Strasbourg for awards of compensation for the infringement of their convention rights by the United Kingdom. However, they had no right to make such a claim before a domestic court in the United Kingdom. This was because the British government had refrained from incorporating convention rights into our domestic law. From 1968 onwards, however, there was steadily growing pressure to do this. There were parallels between the debates in my jurisdiction and that which culminated in your Bill of Rights, Act 1990. In each jurisdiction, there was an initial project to introduce legislation that would permit the courts to strike down legislation that was inconsistent with fundamental rights. Your Law Reform Select Committee advised against this, and your Act expressly provides by Section 4 that the Act is not to have paramount effect over other legislation. In 1994, a bill was introduced in the House of Lords by Lord Leicester, a member of the minority Liberal Democrat Party, which would have empowered our court to disapply inconsistent existing and future legislation. The bill was given a rough ride by Conservative ministers and it found it. However, in May 1997, a Labour government was voted into office on a manifesto which included a commitment to incorporate the Convention into our domestic law. And that was honoured by the Human Rights Act 1998. The model that was chosen and which became our Human Rights Act largely followed your own Bill of Rights Act. Public authorities are placed under a duty to comply with the Convention. If they do not, they are liable to pay compensation. They have a defence, however, if an Act of Parliament requires them or authorises them to act in a way that infringes the Convention. Parliament remains supreme. A minister promoting a bill has, however, to state whether or not he believes that the bill is compatible with the Convention. And the Court has power under Section 4 of the Act to make a declaration that an Act is incompatible with the Convention. Where a declaration of incompatibility is made, Parliament has a fast track procedure under which it can rectify the legislation. And it almost invariably has rectified the legislation either in the conventional way or by using the fast track. Section 6 of your Bill of Rights Act provides, whenever an enactment can be given a meaning that is consistent with the rights and freedoms contained in this Bill of Rights, that meaning shall be preferred to any other meaning. Section 3 of our Act provides, so far as it's possible to do so, primary legislation and subordinate legislation must be read and given effect to in a way which is compatible with Convention rights. <coughs> 
you might think that there is no difference in principle between these two provisions. But I doubt whether the provision in your Act has been given as radical an effect as the provision in ours. The first case in which the House of Lords had to consider this provision was the Crown against A. That case concerned the so-called rape shield imposed by Section 41 of the Youth and Criminal Evidence Act 1999. This placed a general prohibition on adducing evidence or cross-examining a complainant in a rape case about her previous sexual experience. The majority of the law lords held that Section 3 permitted, that Section 3 of the Human Rights Act, permitted and required them to read this provision as subject to the implied proviso that the prohibition didn't apply where such evidence or cross-examination was required to ensure a fair trial. This robbed the section of most of its effect. It was contrary to the intention of Parliament as derived from the clear wording of the statute, which was to shield a complainant from such evidence and cross-examination in all circumstances. In subsequent decisions, the House of Lords made it clear that Section 3 of the Human Rights Act had this startling effect. Gaidan and Godin Mendoza was concerned with the rights of a person living with a protected tenant as his or her husband of wife after the protected tenant died. The issue was whether the words as his or her wife or husband embraced a couple who were living together in a homosexual relationship. In 1994, before the Human Rights Act had been enacted, the House of Lords had considered this very question and answered it no. But in Gaidan, the surviving partner argued that this interpretation would be contrary to Article 14 of the Convention, which prohibited discrimination, and that the House was bound by Section 3 to alter its interpretation of the phrase. The House accepted this. Let me read you some passages of the leading speech of Lord Nichols. All legislation must be read and given effect to in a way which is compatible with convention rights, so far as it is possible to do so. This is the intention of Parliament expressed in Section 3, and the courts must give effect to this intention. It's now generally accepted that the application of Section 3 does not depend upon the presence of ambiguity in the legislation being interpreted even if construed according to the ordinary principles of interpretation, the meaning of the legislation admits of no doubt Section 3 may nonetheless require the legislation to be given a different meaning. From this it follows that the interpretive obligation decreed by Section 3 is of an unusual and far-reaching character. Section 3 may require a court to depart from the unambiguous meaning the legislation would otherwise bear. In the ordinary course, the interpretation of legislation involves seeking the intention reasonably to be attributed to Parliament in using the language in question. Section 3 may require the court to depart from this legislative intention, that is, depart from the intention of Parliament which enacted the legislation. The Lords in Gaidan made it clear that there were limits to this startling principle of interpretation. The particular provision could not be interpreted in a way that was contrary to the main thrust or the purpose of the legislation as a whole. Lord Roger coined the memorable phrase that the provision had to be read in a way that went with the grain of the legislation. I was not at this time sitting as a law lord. I personally had doubts about the constitutionality of an approach to statutory interpretation that deliberately departed from the clear intention of the Parliament that enacted the legislation. I expected Lord Bingham, the senior law lord, who had not sat on the appeal in Gaidon, to share these doubts. After all, he and Anderson, the Home Secretary, had described as judicial vandalism an attempt to give a statutory provision an effect quite different from that which Parliament intended and which would, I quote, go well beyond any interpretive process sanctioned by Section 3. However, in Attorney General's reference number four of 2002, Lord Bingham expressly approved the approach in Gaidon. He held the interpretive obligation under Section 3, a very strong and far-reaching one, which may require the court 
to depart from the legislative intention of Parliament. I sat with the Law Lords on that case and one was one of the majority that agreed with Lord Bingham. Perhaps rather pusillanimously, I was persuaded to suppress my reservations about the constitutionality of this. In doing so, I ex implicitly recognised that we were giving the Human Rights Act paramount effect over the intention of Parliament in subsequent legislation. This accorded with a much quoted and controversial proposition of Lord Justice Laws in Thoburn and Sunderland City that there is a hierarchy of Acts of Parliament, ordinary statutes and constitutional statutes which trump ordinary statutes and that the Human Rights Act was a constitutional statute. The most recent example of this approach to interpretation on the part of the Supreme Court was a case called Wire, which caused the court more trouble than any other under my presidency. It was about a draconian obligation placed on the court to confiscate the property of convicted criminals under the Proceeds of Crime Act. We restricted this obligation by implying a proviso, except insofar as such an order would be disproportionate, thereby making confiscation subject to judicial control in a manner that certainly did not reflect the intention of Parliament as derived from the reading of the Act. Parliament had not to give the judge any such discretion. Well, how, you may ask, has the House of Lords and the Supreme Court got away with this creative approach to statutory interpretation without resistance or protest? The answer, I think, is that in the individual case, it's an approach that leaves both sides relatively happy. The alternative is a declaration of incompatibility. But the claimant doesn't usually want this because it will mean that he has no remedy. Ministers do not like declarations of incompatibility either. Provided that the main thrust of their legislation is not impaired, they usually prefer the court to revise the statute to make it convention compliant rather than declare it incompatible with the convention. I now turn to my thesis that Strasbourg has extended its jurisdiction. When considering any area of law, there is a tendency on the part of the judges to expand its ambit. Lawyers acting for claimants will always be urging them to do so, and hard cases very often provide the final impetus for incremental expansion of the law. The judges of the Strasbourg Court have not been immune from this tendency. They've been abetted in it by the principle that the Convention is a living instrument. So that they've extended the ambit of the Convention rights from those that the founding subscribers of the Convention would have had in contemplation. Thus, cases on freedom of religion uh, are no longer about freedom to practice one's religion, but about the right to wear religious clothing or symbols at work or at school. Well, this form of extension is, in my view, entirely legitimate. But the nature of individual human rights is very different from the nature of the jurisdiction within which the subscribers to the Convention agreed that those rights would be observed. Initially, the Strasbourg Court accepted that the Convention was essentially about how the signatories would treat those within their own territorial jurisdictions. That changed in two respects. <clears throat> the first at least paid lip service to the concept of territorial jurisdiction. In a series of decisions, the Strasbourg Court has held that the Convention can be violated if a state expels or extradites a person from within its territory to a country where his or her human rights will be or are likely to be violated. The relevant breach of the Convention is identified as taking place within the territory from which the individual is expelled. This is, I think, a little specious. These decisions, in effect, require a country to grant a restricted form of asylum to individuals who have no right to remain and whose presence may be contrary to the national interest or even pose a threat to national security. While these decisions have a humanitarian justification, they cannot have been within the intention of the original parties to the Convention, who almost at the same time entered into a refugee convention which dealt expressly with asylum 
in terms that produce a very different result to that produced by the decisions of the Strasbourg Court. The first such decision in 1989 involved a Mr. Suring. There was cogent evidence in the form of his own admissions that he had committed two capital murders in Virginia in the United States. The United Kingdom proposed to extradite him to the United States to stand trial for them. He applied to the Strasbourg Court, contending that if he was extradited, he would be placed on death row, and this meant that his extradition would subject him to inhuman treatment, contrary to Article 3. <coughs> the Strasbourg Court upheld his claim and held that he couldn't be extradited. The next case in this sequence, Jahal and the United Kingdom, caused much greater concern to the United Kingdom government. Mr. Chahal was a Sikh separatist leader who'd unsuccessfully sought asylum in the United Kingdom. The Secretary of State had concluded that his presence in the United Kingdom posed a threat to national security and proposed to deport him to India. He applied to Strasbourg, arguing that his deportation would infringe Article 3 because he'd be exposed to the risk of torture or inhuman treatment if sent home. Such a claim, if made good, would normally have entitled him to the grant of asylum under the Refugee Convention. But there is an exception under that convention that provides that there is no obligation to grant asylum to a refugee if there are reasonable grounds for regarding him as a danger to the security of the country wishing to deport him. Despite this, his application to Strasbourg succeeded. The court held that Article 3 is infringed if a state deports or extradites a person to a third country where there is a real risk that he will suffer torture or other ill treatment contrary to Article 3. Deportation will violate the convention even if he's a menace to the security of the state that wants to deport him. Nor was the United Kingdom entitled to hold this unwelcome visitor in detention without charging him with a criminal offence. Torture and similar treatment is so abhorrent that one could readily understand this decision. But if it were correct in principle, it was hard to see why it shouldn't apply to extradition or deportation of a person who would be at real risk of violation of other, less fundamental human rights when returned home albeit that the risk of such treatment would not entitle him to refugee status. Indeed, in a number of cases, the Strasbourg Court stated that it would not exclude just such a possibility. However, six years or so elapsed, during which there was no instance of the Strasbourg Court actually applying the same approach to human rights other than Article 3. This was the position when the case of Allah came before me when I was presiding as Master of the Rolls in the Court of Appeal. There were, in fact, two appeals raising the same point which were heard together. The appellants were failed asylum seekers who challenged the right of the United Kingdom to deport them to their own countries on the grounds that this would infringe their right of freedom of religion under Article 9 of the Convention because they wouldn't be permitted to practice their religions on return. In the Court of Appeal, we rejected their appeals. In giving the judgment of the court, I expressed the view, I quote, that the convention was not designed to impact on the rights of states to refuse entry to aliens or to remove them. The convention was designed to cover the treatment of those living within the territorial jurisdiction of the member states. I acknowledge that Strasbourg had made an exception where a risk of torture was involved and had recognized that a similar approach might be adopted in relation to other human rights but I observed that Strasbourg had never in fact adopted such an approach other than in relation to Article 3. I then said, where the convention is invoked on the sole ground of the treatment to which an alien refused the right to enter or to remain is likely to be subjected by the receiving state and that treatment is not sufficiently severe to engage Article 3, the English court is not required to recognize that any article of the convention is or may be engaged. In so holding, I had in mind Section 2 of the Human Rights Act, which requires a court, when dealing with a human rights issue, to take account of decisions of the Strasbourg Court. It didn't seem to me that this required us to follow dicta of the court that had never been the foundation of an actual decision. The appellants appealed to the House of Lords, 
and although their appeal failed, Lord Bingham held that our approach to the Strasbourg jurisprudence was wrong. Because Strasbourg had recognized that deportation could engage convention rights other than Article 3, the English court was obliged to adopt the same approach. He made the following statement of principle. The House is required by Section 2 of the Human Rights Act to take into account any relevant Strasbourg case law. While such case law is not strictly binding, it has been held that courts should, in the absence of some special circumstances, follow any clear and constant jurisprudence of the Strasbourg Court. This reflects the fact that the Convention is an international instrument, the correct interpretation of which can be authoritatively expounded only by the Strasbourg Court. From this it follows that a national court, subject to a duty such as that imposed by Section 2, should not, without strong reason, dilute or weaken the effect of the Strasbourg case law. It is, of course, open to member states to provide for rights more generous than those guaranteed by the Convention. But such provisions should not be the product of interpretation of the Convention by national courts, since the meaning of the Convention should be uniform throughout the states party to it. The duty of national courts is to keep pace with the Strasbourg jurisprudence as it involves over time, no more, but certainly no less. This statement of principle has recently come under attack, but that is a topic for, that justifies a lecture of its own. The fact is that Strasbourg has always recognized the sensitivity of the right of a state to control immigration. Although it has recognized that deportation to a state where human rights will not be respected is in theory capable of infringing the convention, it has done so in very guarded terms almost invariably by way of explanation of why an application has failed. It has laid down a principle that where human rights other than Article 3 rights are invoked, deportation will only infringe the Convention if the deportee faces a real risk of a flagrant violation of the rights in question in the country to which he is to be deported. In a case where the Article 6 right to a fair trial was involved, Mamat Kulov and Astaroff against Turkey, so Nicholas Bratz and two of his colleagues explained that what the word flagrant is intended to convey is a breach of the principle of a fair trial guaranteed by Article 6, which is so fundamental as to amount to a nullification or destruction of the very essence of the right. For some years after Ulla, Strasbourg did not allow any challenges to deportation on the ground that if deported, the applicant would face a violation of convention rights other than the Article 3 rights. In these circumstances, the House of Lords broke new ground in 2009 when it allowed an appeal making such a challenge on the ground that if deported, the appellant's right to respect for family life under Article 8 would be violated. The case was E.M. and Lebanon. A mother and her young son had failed in a claim for asylum in the United Kingdom and faced being returned home to Lebanon. There, under Sharia law, when the son reached the age of seven, he would be removed from the custody of his mother and placed in the custody of his father, from whom he and his mother were estranged. The House of Lords held that these facts satisfied the stringent test of a flagrant breach that destroyed the very essence of the right to respect for family life and allowed the mother's appeal. Recently, for the first time, Strasbourg has held that deportation would violate Article 6 of the Convention. The case is that of Abu Qatada, to which I referred earlier. Abu Qatada is a Jordanian citizen who faces trial in Jordan on terrorist charges. The United Kingdom government is anxious to deport him to Jordan because they believe that he poses a threat to national security in the United Kingdom. He resisted deportation on two grounds. The first was that there was a real risk that he'd be tortured if returned to Jordan. To meet that contention, the United Kingdom obtained specific assurances from Jordan that he wouldn't be tortured. The second ground that was, that was that there was a real risk of a flagrant breach of his right to a fair trial if returned to Jordan because of the likelihood that evidence obtained by torture would be used against him. I presided over this case in the House of Lords and we rejected both contentions. He then applied to Strasbourg. Strasbourg held that we had been entitled to rely upon the assurances obtained from Jordan by the United Kingdom 
in rejecting his claim that there was a real risk that he would be tortured if returned. Strasbourg held, however, that he was right to contend that, that the likelihood that evidence obtained by torture would be admitted meant that he faced a real risk that there would be a flagrant violation of his right to a fair trial and that this was a bar to his deportation. This decision of the Strasbourg Court and the earlier decisions in relation to Article 3 extend the ambit of the Convention so as to cover events outside the jurisdiction of the signatories to it. No such element of extraterritorial is involved in the far more common situation where it's held that deportation will infringe Article 8 of the Convention because of the effect that this will have on the family unit within the territory of the state in question by, for instance, sending away the father from the family unit. It probably won't surprise you that the English media are particularly vociferous in attacking the Convention for preventing the deportation of alien criminals who have established family links within the United Kingdom. And not just the media. On the 18th of February of this year, the Home Secretary, Theresa May, attacked the judiciary for its interpretation of Article 8. She commented, Some of our judges appear to have got it into their heads that Article 8 of the Convention, the right to family life, is an absolute unqualified right. This means that if a foreign criminal can show that he has a family in this country, they take the view that he has a right to remain here, regardless of the gravity of the offence. That interpretation is wrong. This speech was reported by the Mail Online under the heading, Theresa May vows to crush judges' revolt by rushing through tough new laws. Some expressed the view that a preferable course would have been for her to appeal against the decisions that she considered were wrong in law. I now turn to the other respect in which, this time quite unquestionably, the Strasbourg Court has extended the scope of jurisdiction of a state within which it's bound under Article 1 of the Convention to respect Convention rights. Here as so often the relevant decision arises out of applications against the United Kingdom. The case is Al Skaney in the United Kingdom. Between May 2003 and March 2004, British forces were responsible for maintaining law and order in Basra, pending the transfer of power to the interim Iraqi government. The applicants were relatives of five Iraqis shot by British forces during this period. They contended that the United Kingdom had an obligation to hold independent investigations into the five deaths by reason of Article 2 of the Convention. The issue was whether the deaths had occurred within the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom, applying the meaning that jurisdiction bears in Article 1 of the Convention. A similar issue had been considered by the Grand Chamber in Bankovic in Belgium, where claims were brought by relatives of victims killed by a NATO bombing raid on a TV centre in Belgrade during the conflict in Kosovo. The Grand Chamber had held that this event did not take place within the jurisdiction of the states involved. Jurisdiction was held to be essentially a territorial concept, subject to limiting exceptions recognised by international law, such as ships and consular premises. Thus, a state had jurisdiction over its domestic territory. In Al Skaney, the Grand Chamber abon abandoned the territorial approach to, jur to jurisdiction. It involved a quite different principle, sometimes called the state agent principle. It held, It is clear that whenever the state, through its agents, exercises control and authority over an individual, and thus jurisdiction, the state is under an obligation under Article 1 to secure to that individual the rights and freedoms under Section 1 of the Convention that are relevant to the situation of the individual. On this basis, the deaths of the Iraqis killed in Basra were held to have occurred within the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom for the purposes of the Convention. I cannot resist reading a passage from the concurring opinion of the Italian judge at Strasbourg, Judge Bonello. Any state that worships fundamental rights on its own territory, but then feels free to make a mockery of them anywhere else, does not, so far as I am concerned, belong to the comity of nations for which the supremacy of human rights is both a mission and a clarion call. In substance, the United Kingdom is arguing, sadly I believe, that it ratified the Convention with the deliberate intent of regulating the conduct of its armed forces according to latitude. 
gentlemen at home, hoodlums elsewhere. <laughs> that kind of abuse is not calculated to endear the Strasbourg court to the British public. <laughs> there have, however, been more substantial grounds for public or governmental disaffectation with the decisions of the Strasbourg court than, court than judicial abuse. The government has been particularly concerned with problems that the convention, as interpreted by the Strasbourg court, has placed in the way of dealing with the threat of terrorism. There is a considerable number of aliens in the United Kingdom who have no right to be there and whom the government believes, but cannot adduce evidence to prove, pose a terrorist threat. They cannot be deported because of the ill treatment they're likely to be subjected to if sent home. The government would like to detain them to ensure that they're not involved in terrorist activity, but this would infringe their human rights. The government has had to ascertain, by fighting a series of expensive state-funded challenges in the courts, just how far it can go in imposing restrictive measures on these people. But strangely, it's not matters such as these that have been that have particularly inflamed Parliament and the public, but the decision of the Strasbourg Court in a case called Hearst and the United Kingdom. Article 3 of the first protocol to the Convention provides that the contracting parties undertake to hold free elections under conditions that will ensure the free expression of the opinion of the people in the choice of the legislature. The Grand Chamber in Hearst held that a blanket ban on any convicted prisoner voting, which is a ban we have in the United Kingdom, infringes that provision. This is one of the rare cases where Parliament has not been prepared to pass a suitable enactment to bring our law into line with what Strasbourg has ruled are our international obligations. David Cameron said that the idea of giving prisoners the right to vote made him feel physically sick. By signing up to the Convention, the United Kingdom undertook to abide by the decisions of the Strasbourg Court. Yet there is a bill before Parliament that offers three choices. Two of them involve giving the vote to a limited category of prisoners. The third involves refusing to do so and thus defying the Strasbourg Court and deliberately flouting the United Kingdom's obligations under international law. Uh, I'd been appointed to sit on a joint parliamentary committee to consider this matter, so I think I should say no more about it. <laughs> In closing, I should mention the re recent report of a government commission set up to consider the desirability of a United Kingdom Bill of Rights to incorporate and build on the United Kingdom's obligations under the Convention. The members of this commission had strongly conflicting views as to the merits of the Convention. But the majority concluded, for differing reasons, that a case had been made out for a domestic Bill of Rights some time in the future. I side with the minority that was not persuaded of this, but at all events, it is not something that is going to happen in the near future. Thank you very much. colleagues, friends, students, members of the public, welcome. On behalf of the Otago branch of the New Zealand Law Society, it falls to me as president to thank your Lordship for tonight's address. It is something of a different occasion as thanks go on behalf of the society. It is 40 years since an academic lawyer was last president, and that was the late Professor Frank Guest in whose honour this address is given tonight. So, for me at least, it is the closing of a rather nice circle. In 1959, 90 years after the foundation of this university, and 80 years after the founding of the Law Society in Otago, Frank Guest was appointed as Foundation Professor of Law. And this is what the Council of the Law Society concluded at the time. The Society should feel very gratified and happy that the post has been given to someone who is a practical, practicing lawyer and not only a theorist. <laughs> <laughs> this somewhat barbed comment presupposes that there is a bright line between people of practicality 
and those that inhabit theory or principle. But whatever the council thought it was trying to convey, I have no doubt that it would see your Lordship's address tonight as reflecting the twin faces of lawyering that it's so valued. It's hard to think of something more practice-based and yet theoretical in giving effect to an international human rights instrument in the concept, context of domestic law. Your Lordship, thank you for a compelling look at the tensions and hostilities that lie within this process. From the disenchantment of Westminster with some of the decisions of the Strasbourg Court, to the radical effect on statutory interpretation that reading legislation compatibly with convention rights has had in the UK courts. And thank you too for alerting us to what might lie in the future. If we hear about prisoners getting the vote or the introduction of a United Kingdom Bill of Rights, we will understand better than we might otherwise have done, and we will remember this night as the reason. I ask you to thank the